And why do we care about all of this? So what, these energy shells exist and so forth. This is chemistry, not biology. So why do we as biologists care? Because all of this, all of this energy state business is what your metabolism is based on. Really, what is food? Well, we think of food as proteins and carbohydrates and fats and so forth, but really what food is are a bunch of high energy electrons. And what you do is you take those high energy electrons in whatever form they happen to be, candy bar or, or whatever, and you drop those electrons down to lower energy states. And that is how you release the energy that you need to be able to move your muscles, pump ions across membranes, and do all the things that living things have to do. And here's what we're getting at. If we look here at the three different energy shells, there's the first energy level, the second, and the third, each electron in, in these different energy shells literally has a different amount of energy. So what you can do is you can take an energy level one new, uh, uh, electron and move it to a higher energy state and literally absorb energy. And then you can release that energy by taking that electron and moving it back down to its ground state. And when you do that, the energy must be released in some way. This has to do with thermodynamics, which we're going to study in great detail in Unit 4. That energy then can be released to do a number of different things. It can be used to move muscles. It can be used to, again, move ions. It can be used to do all sorts of different things that are required by your metabolism. So that's why we care about these energy states. They are what your metabolism is. They determine the energy that you have available to you. So food is high energy uh, electrons. And what you do is you take those high energy electrons in your body move them down to a lower energy state, and then release them as low energy electrons. And that is the whole basis of metabolism. So that's why we're interested in it. And again, you see the same sort of thing here. You have a, an electron at, its, at a higher energy state. It can drop down to its ground state. And when it does so, it has to release some sort of, of energy. It could be heat. could be light. could be something else. It could be coupled to, again, a muscular contraction mechanism that allows the muscle to contract. So that's a better view of what metabolism really is. It's managing the energy states of the electrons in a living system. Now there's one other thing that we want to talk about before we get into the more detailed aspects of biology, and that is this covalent bond concept is not complete. I haven't completely told you everything about it. Here we have one type of covalent bond, and that's written as, this, as the bar between these two hydrogens. And we saw this before. In fact, if we go back up, we saw that exact bond here. That's the bond that we're talking about. Now we can draw that essentially as a stick connecting the two hydrogens. But notice again, remember, it's two electrons that are actually being shared. So here's the two electrons being shared. Now what's interesting about this one is that the hydrogen here and the hydrogen here take this electron density. Remember, the electrons are a smear around these two hydrogen ions. They take the smear and smear it out evenly across these two nuclei. And that makes this bond what we call nonpolar may not know quite what that means, but contrast it with this one. Here is hydrogen now where it's bonded with oxygen. And the electrons will do the same thing. The electron density is split between the hydrogen uh, nucleus and the oxygen nucleus. But oxygen has a property that we call electronegativity. In particular, it has a high electronegativity. Hydrogen's electronegativity is much lower. And what that basically means in a rough sort of way is that oxygen absorbs this electron density more closely than the hydrogen does. And so what tends to happen is this oxygen, the electron density is clustered mainly around it and less so around this proton and this proton here, which is, again, a proton is simply the nucleus of the hydrogen ion atom. And so what that means then is since the electrons have a negative charge, you get this high density of negative charge around this oxygen and it exposes this proton slightly, and so you get a slight positive charge. So this right here, that symbol, this symbol right here, is a lowercase Greek letter delta. And so we say lowercase delta plus, which means a slight positive charge here. It isn't the, that the electrons don't go around here at all. They do. But most of the electron density is here. And so that's why you get a slight delta negative, a slight negative charge there, where the, where the oxygen happens to be. So these bonds, this one and this one, are referred to as polar. They're polarized because one side of it is slightly positive, the other side is slightly negative. This is exactly the opposite. There's no polarity because the electron density is split evenly. 
there's no positive or negative charges that are actually showing up anywhere. Now, this changes the chemistry of these molecules completely. Water becomes polar and therefore becomes a polar solvent, whereas hydrogen gas is nonpolar. And so that sets up a very interesting situation. If we have two water molecules, for example, this is hydrogen, this is the oxygen, so this is H2O. This, remember, absorbs the electron density, and so there's a negative charge here. This is the positive charge here, and so you get an electrostatic interaction between these two things. The positive charge attracts the negative charge, and you get a slight bond that can form between those two, that yellow streak right here that I'm highlighting. That yellow streak right here is called a hydrogen bond. So it's not ionic, it's not covalent, it's its own thing, and it's much, much weaker. That single bond right here is much weaker than this covalent bond, for example, right here. However, the bond here gives water its properties. It gives water, for example, its surface tension, as you can see in this picture here. There's a, a water-striding spider literally walking on the surface of water. And that's, you can see the indentations in the water where the legs are, are touching it. That is being held up. This, in this arachnid here is being held up by these hydrogen bonds, literally being held off the, off the, ground by the, or off the water by these hydrogen bonds. So they're weak electrostatic interactions and allow this thing to also do this. The water itself, since it's, it's polar, will bond to itself. And so you see here in this picture, you've got a bunch of polar bonds and all these little dotted lines are the hydrogen bonds holding the water together. So water connects to itself and therefore it dissolves itself very, very well. But now compare it to this though. If you look at this, this is carbon and hydrogen. Each black is a carbon, each white is a hydrogen. The carbon and the hydrogen bond is approximately equal electronegativity. So that bond between carbon and hydrogen is nonpolar. So there's no positive or negative charges here. By the way, this molecule has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. And it is completely otherwise, all of its bonds are saturated with hydrogen. So that makes it what we call in organic chemistry an ane. A-N-E is the ending. And there's eight carbons. Therefore, this is octane or gasoline. So here you notice the water is not bonding to the gasoline at all. And so it literally will avoid the gasoline. And the gasoline will not dissolve in it because the gasoline is nonpolar. So that means that gas and water will not mix. And that's exactly why it is that you never try to put out a gasoline fire with water. Because if you do, you put water on here that simply spreads the octane around and it will allow it to ignite more easily. So this is a an extremely important property of living systems. Nonpolar solvents or nonpolar molecules cannot go into solution in water. Anything that is polar, however, or has a charge of any sort, like an ion, will tend to go into solution in water. And I say tend to because it doesn't always have to. Sometimes if it is polar but the molecule is huge, it won't necessarily completely become dissolved. But certainly things like octane, which have no uh, polar polarity to any of their covalent bonds will never go into solution in water. So this, oddly enough, this property is what gives living systems one of its key important uh, uh, necessary properties. And that is that it can use this, these hydrogen bonds, to form structures. And this is what this gentleman here, Andrew Pohoril, uh, from NASA Ames Research Center, he was asked a question one time by a general audience member, why is it that we believe that living systems must be based on a polar solvent? Remember, if we go back to one of the earlier slides, I said specifically that NASA, the Curiosity mission, was looking specifically for water uh, on Mars to look for the existence of a polar solvent there. And it found it, by the way. And uh, the answer that Andrew gave was this, is that the solvent must promote self-organization of organic matter into functional structures, which are mostly based on non-covalent interactions like hydrogen bonds. Hydrophobic interactions are responsible for many self-organizing phenomena in biological systems, such as the formation of membranes and protein folding. Okay, so what does that all mean? What he's getting at is this, is that if you have these kinds of polar bonds and you have a polar solvent, you get structures, sort of like this. You see this droplet. This droplet is a structure that forms automatically on its own. And in fact, this is somewhat related to the concept of a membrane. Membranes will form in water automatically because of this property of polarity in the water molecules. So that's a very interesting thing. You get membranes automatically by simply by putting a particular type of molecules into water. 
you don't have to build them and hold them together. They hold together on their own. And this is what he's getting at here, protein folding. I kind of wish he hadn't said that. Really, what he's getting at is that the proteins have to fold. Proteins are huge molecules, which we're going to study later in the course. But they have to fold in particular ways in order to get them, in order to become functional structures. Proteins, and this is the key, proteins are enzymes. Not all, and not all proteins are enzymes, but all enzymes are proteins. And enzymes work by these same kind of hydrogen bonds. And really, the physics of what an enzyme does requires hydrogen bonds and a polar solvent. So here's the deal. If it weren't for water, if there's no polar solvent, you can't have enzymes. Even if they're not made out of protein, you can't have enzymes because the way they work is based on these hydrogen bonds. So therefore, if you can't have something like enzymes, if you have something that's alive, we probably wouldn't recognize it. Because whatever we recognize, enzymes are central to everything that living systems that we're aware of can do. So if you can find a living system that has no enzymes or nothing like enzymes, most of us are pretty sure we would not recognize it as being alive. So that's why it is that the polar solvent is so critical. That'll become more clear as you further on with your studies. So this ends lecture one, well really lecture two, the first one was a syllabus lecture. And now from here on we will go directly to lecture in the class itself. This is the last of the online lectures. All the remaining lectures will be given within the classroom. So I will see you there.